consider your business in the face of the coronavirus pandemic and how you come out the other side whole and with new opportunities. So I'm thrilled today to have on as our guest, Cameron Sterling. Cameron is a loyal ASMP member from Connecticut, a content strategist, and somebody I think has a lot to say about repositioning your business to not only deal with the realities that we're in today, but also how we will be looking at it in the future. So Cameron, I'm gonna turn it over to you and thank you very much for being on today. And thank you everybody for tuning in. Hi, okay, thank you, my pleasure. Can you hear me okay? Great, okay. So I'm gonna start off with this presentation and then we can do some Q&A towards the end and uh, maybe hopefully if there's time we'll review uh, a couple of websites that I have that I think are good examples of good content strategy working. So I'll start off by sharing my screen here of the PDA. Uh, okay, do you see it? First slide. Okay, are we good to go? Do you see the welcome image? Yes. Perfect, you thank you. Okay, welcome. So content strategy for photographers. First, let's start off with our mindset. There's the fixed mindset and the growth mindset. And I like to think of this concept a lot, especially now with so much change going on. So I think a beginner's mind and an attitude of openness to new ways of working, new ways of looking for work, new markets, it kind of gives me hope to have a a real growth mindset. And before we do, I want to kind of go into this. I want to give you an overview of what we're going to be talking about with content strategy. So there are four key parts to the content that your audience needs, how to show it, and why to show it. So there's why you, why are you providing this service? Why them? Why are you providing it to your audience, to your clients? What is the gap between you getting work or not getting work? And what is the actual work you're providing, your images, your galleries? And of all of this today, I'm going to hone in on the risk component because I think that's really one of the most important parts of content strategy today is helping your buyer reduce the risk to working with you because there is so much uncertainty and risk happening now. And if we can help people feel more comfortable and more assured that you're the right choice for their project, and that you have everything covered or you will when you can start working again, um, the risk component is really important. So I am going to talk about a few of these other parts of content strategy because they relate to this risk. Um, but I want to keep in mind that that's kind of the, the center point of what we're going to be talking about today. Okay, so first let's go back in time to another time when the industry changed a lot with Polaroid, everyone's favorite story that we all know just to remind ourselves how our industry has changed and gone through upheavals in the past and how we had this company that was once a real growth and innovator and then it entered into a fixed kind of mindset phase and then it ultimately failed only to be reinvented a few times again but that's kind of a different story but i think it's it's good for us to keep into perspective some of the changes our industry has had in the past particularly with digital now with digital it happened over a period of well, five to 10 years, uh, maybe even longer if you want to look at the, the bigger picture arc, arc of it, but it really feels like there was a five or 10 year period where everything really switched over. Now with COVID-19, everything is changing in a matter of weeks to a month. So we're kind of compressing huge amounts of change into a much shorter period of time. But change is inevitable. It always happens whether we want it to or not. It can be scary and daunting, and we don't know what's in front of us or what we're looking at, but we know what's there. And it can also be beautiful, and it can look like something that we just want to gaze at and, and be inspired by. Now, through change, I'm from Connecticut, so I have Connecticut here. Now, I love Connecticut because I live here, but also I think it's a good example of the shape of the state it's basically a rectangle with a little nub on the bottom of it. And if it didn't have that, it would just kind of look like any other common rectangle. 
But that little nub is kind of like Connecticut's USB, a unique selling point. And that's really what makes the state the state of Connecticut, is having that little extra bit to it that makes the sort of safe, ordinary rectangle shape, it makes it a little bit different. Okay, so first I want to cover the base, some of the basics. Why is a website important? So people may hear about you by referral or social media, but the first thing they're going to do is Google you. So when they get to your website, you only have a few seconds to make an impact. They need to be convinced you have a solution to their problem. And if it doesn't, they're going to leave. So the more noise than signal you have on your website homepage, especially, they're going to leave. On the other hand, you can't have it too minimal. Otherwise, there's not enough context for your offer. So websites that are only displaying images are a thing of the past. And I think more and more people are realizing this now, especially websites that are promoting retail services to buyers who don't buy photography every day. So today, a website is your primary tool for motivating leads. It's the difference between a portfolio website and one that helps people become happy clients is it inspires your ideal clients to take an action, to not just look at your pictures. So the way you do this is you put a piece of positioning copy, what you do for who, your USB, on every page in some way, shape, or fashion and you need clear calls to action on every page of your website. What do you want the visitor to do next at each stage of their journey through your content? Do you want them to go to a specific page to contact you? Showing testimonials and testimonial work are important and they shouldn't be limited to your galleries. I'll get more about into that a little bit later. So what pages do we need on a website? Our content. So there's the home page, the about page, the work examples, the contact. Those people have been doing a lot. Now, some of the newer pages people may not be doing or have thought about are your services and packages, your FAQ, your testimonial, your blog, and your philosophy, your why. And I'll get into more of these a little bit in a second. So people scan websites for information that's brief and relevant. And as people scroll, you can use more words. But right in the beginning, you don't want to overwhelm them with copy and content. We want to have that further down below the scroll line. We want to give them more text and information as they're ready for it through your journey. So in the very beginning, you're saying, why you? This is your elevator pitch up for your homepage, your storefront. Everyone now, especially now, their website is their storefront. It sets the tone both visually and with language, and it helps your audience quickly understand and self-select your offer. So there's the pitch. What is different and what is the same about your offer? What are the benefits of your business? Identify your niche. Now, I'm going to get into the, what, why you need to talk about what's different and the same a little bit later in this talk. So you're above the scroll line offer. You need to distill what you do for your ideal clients into one sentence. The first images and text you see before scrolling down. I know a lot of photography businesses aren't comfortable using text, especially front and center. They want a picture, but it can be really helpful to use language to set the tone for what you're about that goes with your business. And the message needs to be easy to understand and customer centric. Because if you don't say this, they're going to imagine whatever they want to and you'll lose control of your brand narrative. So you're going to describe who you work with, what you'll do for them, what results they'll get, and don't make your audience work too hard to figure out why they need you. So you don't want to sit be saying right here why you're better, all the awards you won, 10 other things you do, discounts and special offers. These things don't make much difference at this point in their experience through your content. OK. This is a picture I made of <laughs> my son's Legos. They're little Lego people. Now, as you can see, they all have a lot going on. In fact, they all have maybe too much going on. So think of this visually as their pitches. Now, what they really want is this. It's a much cleaner, simple message. So I just want to put this visual into you when you think about your pitch and how to minimize it. So you have the essential bits here and how you're showing yourself. 
Okay, so you're going to use a version of this pitch in your about section on your website, your social profiles, your new client emails, and your introductions. The below the scroll line pitch is when you can go into a little more detail with text. How do you get your, your clients started? And remember, for, in terms of SEO, search engines will pick up on all of this text. So use your SEO keywords when you're writing this. Okay, I want to talk about, for a moment about your brand story or your about pages, people often call it. This is where clients learn about you, but it's really in the context of what you can do for them. It's really about why they should feel compelled to work with you because people buy from brands that they know, like, and trust. So you're going to share part of your story and your brand story that creates an emotion with your audience. The about page should not just be a chronology of your events. Your business brand story is part of your key marketing materials that helps people understand what you're about and trust you. It sets you apart. It helps people relate and align with your values and decide if they want to work with you because of something that's unique about you or not. What part of your story do you have in common with your audience? It helps them feel comfortable to know that you share a similar experience and not sense of knowledge. Status alignment is also important. A lead is more receptive to your offer when they feel that something about you is on the same level with them. When you have key experiences in common, when your lead sees that you understand who they are and, and then helps them, fit you, helps them fit you into their world, world. So maybe it was a moment about the environment in your past that really got you involved in doing documentary or journalism. And then this would be part of your brand story. Or maybe it was how you learned a certain craft growing up. So it's what you say, here's what I did. This is what I did to get good at being this type of photographer. This is why I have earned your attention and why you should consider my solution to your photography problem. So you're going to include what or who gave you the confidence, the tools, the skills, the drive to do what you do. Maybe it was a coach or an early experience. So these stories are going to help us connect, create meaning, and share values and ideas with your ideal audience. This is all before they pick up the phone or send you an email or answer your first call to action. First call to action. So stories have the power to move us emotionally, entertain us, and inspire you to a tribe. They have highlights, intention, and relief. So you're going to put together the best parts of your story for your audience. And in this story, you are the hero of this story, which, which is, we're going to get to this in a moment, but we also talk about how your clients are really the hero of what you do. But in this story, you are the hero of this brand story. So you're going to use real moments of tension and relief to make it interesting to read. It doesn't need to be long. It might be 500 words. 800 words, 200 words, but it has to have a sense of uh, ebb and flow, intention and relief. And it helps the audience care about you. And of course, you're an image expert, so don't forget to use a quality photo of yourself that conveys that you're a professional. Let your personality differentiate and shine in your portrait of who you are. So many times I see photography websites that there isn't really a relevant or professional or good picture of themselves, and it is incongruent with the brand that they're about. So it's a missed opportunity. Okay, a philosophy page. I'm not gonna get too into this right now, but this is different from your brand story. This is not a bio. This is why you do what you do. This is why you do it the way you do it. This is why your business matters to your client. This is your why. Now, oftentimes you do see a philosophy woven into a brand story but they can also be separate pages about why your business does what it does and why it matters. What are your values that you want your audience to align? Now let's talk about your audience, your clients, and why you're working. These are the people who are your market audience, and these are the people you're speaking to with your content and your marketing. And once you know this, it helps you really make a clear message about how working with you will solve their problem. Because everyone has different problems and has different experiences. So the more you know what kind of chair they'd like to sit in, for example, the better you will be at crafting their your message to meet their needs. So do you specialize in a specific type of client with a range of services or on a specific kind of service with a range of 
client types. This is important for your content message. So people look for a specialist or at least an expert who can solve a specific problem quickly and effectively with low risk and high reward. What do you know about your client? What benefits do they get from working with you? Who are they individually? What are their challenges and aspirations? What do they think they need and what do they really need? That last one is really important. And it's always important to have in the sense of your back of your mind, what are you really solving for your client? What is their deep problem? I'll give an example of um, the lawnmower. When you buy a lawnmower, you're buying a lawnmower to cut your grass, but really you want your grass to look good so you feel good about yourself on your street. That is your more deeper core problem. Uh, more relevant example to photography, why do you buy a portrait of your family? Well, you buy a portrait of your family because you want to remember yourself, but also it's a way of looking at yourself in a beautiful way and you can feel proud of your picture. So there's a sense of esteem and belonging and tribal identity with how the picture is lit and style. Those are some of the deeper reasons why someone buys photography portraits, retail portraits. Think about who your client is on the curve. Are they innovators, early adopters, early majority, late majority, laggards? Now, my business, for example, I have used Zoom for the last several years. Most of my clients who use Zoom were kind of an innovator, early adopter. However, now everyone's on Zoom. So now people who use Zoom are kind of more in the early majority. It's becoming something, a tool that everyone is used to using. So your clients too, most likely you'll be using Zoom and you'll be interacting with them and uh, doing jobs on set where they can, where you can do screen share. Now it might not be Zoom, but it'll be some form of digital technology that they, they didn't think they were gonna need a month or two ago, but now their learning curve has gone up and they're part of that early majority. So how do they like to purchase services? So what has changed with COVID-19? So you wanna research how they used to buy photography, purchasing patterns, is it seasonally, yearly campaigns through an agency rep or directly to you? And then look at how are they now challenged to now buy photography because they still need photography. So what are the ways that people are looking at buying photography today that they didn't before? Okay, services and package. This is another part of your website to have. What services do you do and do you best provide? What are you exceptionally talented at? What services do you enjoy providing? How do you offer added value outside of this? Now, your answers to these questions are all gonna be part of your content and how you write about your content on your services page, which also filters into your SEO. So service types also help your clients quickly understand what you do and how it benefits them. It helps them see themselves and their challenges in your offer and it helps them quickly identify which one of your services is best for them that they might need. Now, service types also help you meet your client's need because you can create services around your skills, interests, and market opportunities, and you can pre-qualify your clients. You, you can also take all of this language that you're using to communicate what you offer and how people can work with you. You can also charge higher rates for specializing on certain types of services. Your FAQ page. Whether you work with an experienced buyer or people who buy photography rarely, an FAQ will help you. So whether you're working with uh, commercial, corporate production, studio sets, not now, but produce work, or if you're working with inexperienced buyers, FAQ is a really important page to have. So what it does on the surface is it answers questions and objections that you know they have before they've asked you can answer questions before you get on the phone and waste your time or waste their time. It also gives you a place on your website to explain further how you work. That may not be appropriate to have on your about page, your brand story, your philosophy page, or your services page. Now, this isn't a contract page. Nothing's legal here. It's a conversation page. So the tone should also be conversational. So what the FAQ page does under the service is it guides the type of questions your clients are offering, asking. It shows that you're an expert with a certain type of experience, and it shows that you have empathy for their perspective and you understand industry norms. So for example, what are industry uh, FAQs? Well, what are your boundaries? What are the hours, the time of day you work? Why do you specialize in a certain thing? 
Do you work alone or do you work with a team? That's especially important to talk about now in an FAQ page post. What type of pre or post-production services do you offer? Digital post, or do you work with a partner or do you outsource that? How do you handle payments? These are all things that are really important. Now you can come up with a lot of other things like, do, well, I was gonna say, do you do casting? How do you do casting? That's gonna be something to think about as we need to work, work through this, but how do you address that particular need? What is safety on set? How, how are you addressing safety in COVID? And that's gonna be something that's a really great kind of FAQ material to have. Because there are so many types of questions that people who buy photography have. Okay, now let's get into risk and the gap between getting work. Okay, so someone is considering your treatment, your offer, your pitch, your resume. So conversion works. Now conversion is when someone says yes, they answer your call to action. When you apply empathy for your audience by delivering your message to a specific person in an appropriate medium at appropriate time and place. So when you get that email that's specifically to you and it's crafted in the right way, comes in at the right time of day and you're in the right place of work, that's gonna help your conversion work. So you're leading them on a destination that they truly need. Again, nothing about this is to deceive or to be um, illicit. This is all something that you wanna help your client because they truly need what you offer. And it's important to have that frame of mind that you have something of value to help them with, with their business. So they take a risk and trust that you will deliver on the expectation. And then you get this happy person who's accepted the offer. <laughs> okay, so trust is important to risk and conversion. Trust is a part of being a compelling brand. Remember Connecticut. A compelling brand is true to its brand story and it doesn't deviate. Trust is when you demonstrate you know the overlap of what you want and what your clients want. Trust is when you show who you are and you make an emotional connection. Trust comes from helping your client make an informed decision. So you are helping them, you're guiding them through the buying process and you are not trying to sell them something they don't need. You're helping them make an informed choice and they can see that when they are buying from you and they will come back and buy from you again or not because of that. So trust is not about being liked. It's about being the right choice for the client's problem. It's not about being cheaper either. <laughs> okay, the happy ending and where you're going here. A brand is an expectation of an experience. The buyer's risk tolerance determines if they act on their belief that the offer will meet expectations. The brand then becomes a delivery on a promise that becomes your brand after you've sold it and everything has gone well. And people trust brands that deliver predictably on promises. Now, just to take a slight tangent, social media and when you post content on social media consistently, that is also a type of promise that you're keeping with your audience. When you consistently deliver appropriate content that's relevant to your audience, you are in very small minor ways, but they add up, you're delivering on the promise of your social media. Okay, the risk gap. Every decision that we face factors in uncertainty, especially now in the times of COVID. We like routines and familiar things because there is certainty and efficiency with them. Well, now everything's gone out the window for a while. So when your mind wants certainty, but your intuition knows that the odds are not certain, you experience a risk gap and you back away. So to reduce the buyer's risk, you show you're an expert at the problem they need with your FAQ and your brand story and your philosophy, perhaps. First, you identify the problem they need solved with your pitch, perhaps, that's on your homepage. Then you take a point of view about how you're gonna solve this, and then you offer a thoughtful solution to their problem. For example, treatments and case studies are and they help reduce risk, and that's why they're there. Although people don't do case studies as much, and I'll talk about that a little bit towards the end, but case studies are really great content for helping show you're an expert in how you solved a problem and how you've taken a point of view on a certain problem. Now, it may not be the point of view that another client wants, but at least you're taking a point of view. So, this is your leads journey through your website. This is your concise and purposeful image gallery and sequence. This is a case study you write and post on social media for all to see and to vet. 
This is how you solved a problem and what the outcome was. Okay, so novelty and your USB. This is an eggplant photograph. And now a lot of fruit, and there's this whole ugly fruit movement, and a lot of fruit has these unusual parts to it, and it typically gets turned into sauces and other things, or it gets wasted, unfortunately. So when you come across uh, an eggplant that has something different about it, you're not quite sure if the unique selling point is something you want to take a risk on. Because novelty produces intrigue, but it also produces in avoidance. And avoidance is not going to help you get your business. New and different things will attract attention quicker. However, this also can trigger anxiety. And the desire for safer things often wins over novelty. So you're probably going to pick an eggplant that looks more like an eggplant than one that has something different about it just because you're, it's a more familiar choice. People want products or services proven to work and solutions that have aligned with their values or solutions that confirm their membership in the tribe. The bigger a decision is, the more likely one is to be risk averse. So if you can see this with buying photography. The bigger the budget, the bigger the ad buy, the more that's on the line, the more likely there is to be a three bid process with treatments and this whole process. But if it's someone's small shop that they're promoting an ad on Instagram, there's a much lower um, risk uh, problem there. So again, early adopters try unproven services like new photographers. They take greater risks on new ideas and ways of working, and they take pride in being an early adopter or tribe. For example, small publication and brands fit into this category. So this is gets back into knowing who your audience is and who you're serving. Novelty and the familiar. Your USB is normal in every way except for one key difference. So you want to show the buyer in your pitch and in your pitch paragraph why this one key thing is the new standard. Look at Apple in their newest media ports. This happens all the time in technology where this new port is becoming the new standard and you should buy into it. So when you think about your own USB, for example, you're the kind of photographer that can now work remotely with all of these, this technology that the client may not have been used to, you're going to talk about this in your FAQ or in your pitch paragraph while working with you and your process is becoming the new standard. So they'll feel safer with it. Risk tolerance. Everyone has a different tolerance for risk and novelty. If you go past this point, people will back off and anxiety will take over. So people also add up risks, not just how big they are. So in your FAQ and pitch paragraph, you want to explain the things that you know are novel and scary about your offer, if they are. Talk about the familiar. So for example, safety on set. You want to talk about the, your processes that might be scary and new to people once we start working again this way, and how you're working on them and put them into a package so people can understand it. You also want to talk about the familiar aspects of your business, like you do what every other photographer does, with post-production, or you charge this similar sta industry standard fees, or you have a certain process, you have all the regular camera equipment. That, that's stuff that's familiar and that they'll understand and, and makes sense because it's um, what they already are, are expecting you to have in some of many ways. So you can also talk about how your the status quo is over. It's never been more apparent now. The status quo of how we worked is over. <laughs> so we don't need to talk too much about that, but it's important to talk to address that perhaps. But then you explain why this new process is better and becoming the new normal, like work, working remotely. There are a lot of there are going to be a lot of new normals that we're going to see over the next several weeks and months with how we work. Testimonials. Okay, another thing to have on your website and ask for them. Testimonials are social proof and they reduce the buyer's risk. So we're reducing risk with these. Now, social proof is more powerful than what we say about ourselves. And I think we all know that. When we look for reviews about products and services, we're more likely to trust what people say, take the average of it, than what the manufacturer says. Testimonials show the happy ending to the story. That's important psychologically speaking for content. Is with, with testimonials and as they're experiencing you through your content, this is the happy ending to the story of working with your, your photography business. Happy, happy photographers. <laughs> okay, calls to action. The obvious call to action on this wind up toy is the red wind up button that's saying wind me. Okay, 
The purpose of your website, don't forget, is to create calls to action to learn more, to sign up for your newsletter, what have you. Your business serves customer, but your businesses also need to stay in business. So uh, many, many times photographers are not asking their audience to sign up for something, to belong to their Instagram, or it's very passive. We have to keep in mind that we have to ask people to take call to action or they won't. So call to action are like stones to cross a river. Buttons like learn more are wayfinding on your website. They help people know where to go next. So think about all the different calls to action you have on your website and how you're leading them through a journey, through your content from the home page to the about page to the FAQ to ultimately to contacting. So they come in all different shapes and sizes, and this is sort of a deeper dive for another conversation, but you can learn about your services, you can schedule a call, you can opt into a mailing list, you can go to certain pages on your website and social media buttons. And then it's also really important to think about the different types, which are transitional calls and more direct calls to action. So transitional calls to action is when you're asking someone a lead to spend more time with you and your brand. They're not ready to buy you, but they want to know more about your story. So they'll follow you on social for a while. You can also have opt-ins. You can post articles, do podcasts. You can have Zoom meetings. These all help your audience spend more time with you and know more about you before, they, before you make a sale. Okay, marketing. We're not going to go into all of different types of marketing here, but brand direct content native and gorilla are some of the big ones. Um, brand is when you just put out content and it creates the feeling about yourself and your brand. Direct is really when you want to measure results, what's happening. Um, native content is like when you're doing a TV spot or something and then guerrilla marketing, which is when you have, you know, the more, um, uh, you know, uh, focusing on stickers or really clever, creative uh, ways of using uh, your brand in the, in the public space. Okay. What's the objective of the marketing? Audience growth to drive a conversion moment, lead building. It's always really important to know what the objective of your content is at every stage. Okay, and always be you. It's okay to model to learn, but this doesn't mean that what someone else is doing is going to work for you. It has to be consistent with your brand's voice across all social platforms, but also be appropriate for each social platform. So this creates a connection based on your strengths that build trust and reduce risk. Sometimes creating a calendar for people is helpful um, because consistency in showing up drives trust. Now, this is a deeper dive for another conversation, but providing valuable content 80% of the times, direct calls to action 20% of the time, there's different theories on how much you should ask versus just give, but it's important to know what you're doing when you're doing it and to know that you're leading your client to the next step. Content needs to lead people to a place that you have in mind for them that they really truly need to go. So what is the outcome that you want to achieve, both in the small way and also in the ultimate way when they end up working with your service? Congruency of your content, this is how things you know, appear across all of your different social platforms. Uh, people talk about this and ask about this a lot. I believe in focusing on platforms that you're good at and working on those the most, but also put working on platforms where you know your audience is. Now for photographers, mostly that's Instagram and their website or, and or LinkedIn and Facebook. Um, Instagram, of course, is the, one of the dominant places where your clients are, so you want to be there too right now. Of course, know what your clients are looking for on each of these platforms. Are they looking for fun entertainment or are they looking for more deeper dive kind of thought, thought pieces? Staying in touch in COVID-19 times. Okay, this is really important today, especially as everyone is kind of sequestered in their houses. Social media, newsletters, articles. You wanna build a network, quality connections, not huge followings that don't mean anything and interfere with people who really do mean something to you for your audience. Articles and videos. So Google likes original content. So for search, when you continuously post, um, Google is going to reward you by having that content show up on a search feed. 
Um, Google likes three to five keywords in your content. It doesn't like too many keywords in your content. So some thoughts to think about. Article marketing is great because it gets distributed far and wide, for example, on LinkedIn. Okay, what is your social content's value? Always know what you're giving people. Are you giving them information, inspiration, entertaining, or a call to action? Instagram, it's a real-time information network and a history. I love Instagram for this because it's a way to share what's going on today, but also you can see what people have been doing the last week or two or three or year. So, and it becomes a tapestry and a mood board for your brand. You can promote your office offer, you can grow your email list. You can also contact people directly through Instagram, which is amazing. Before Instagram, really, you, you had to find their email or the address, but now with Instagram, you can direct message people and leave comments and messages. Okay, so grow your network. How to grow your network, new versus existing people. So you have the people you already know who follow you, and then you have the people who you want to follow you. Now, things like hashtags and ads help people who you don't know find you are actually no hashtags help people who you don't know find you and when you start using ads and comments directly to people you're speaking to people directly so it's how you engage with your audience and the people who do follow you and the people you want to follow you and when you do this it boosts your visibility on the instagram algorithm which attracts more audience ultimately so you can share your brand story in social. Share personal stories that make you a compelling person. You, you've been true to your brand and they can see this through all of your posts and they trust you, it builds trust. So your brand story helps your audience fit into their world. That's important to, to think about, that your brand story helps your audience fit you into their world. Where do you fit into, the, into their needs for solving their problems? So go behind the scenes, share your life, share your process and values, give leads a look at how you do your work, be relatable, share your resources, connect through giving, share your favorite resources, share something you've learned recently. Remember, the market is who you are talking with, the message is what you are saying, and the medium is where you are saying it. And always to love on your clients, especially now. It's really important to know who you're talking to, what you're saying to them, and what channels you're saying in them. Okay, I wanna talk about your goods imagery because um, we're photographers here and you're photographers here. So words are important, but before words can reach our brains, images have already crossed the finish line and are stirring up our emotions. The images are the rabbit and the words are the turtle. When we use pictures and visuals on our website, the first thing people are seeing is the images and it's going right into their brain before they're reading any of your words. It's important to really be thinking about that through, through their journey. So this is important because it's the first thing your audience takes in. The images are always turned on and the message will sink in ultimately more than words. So remember, what does your audience need to know about your work? What is their problem? What do they stand to gain or lose from working with you? And what does this happy place look like that you're talking about in your content and in your pitch? Your photographic, photographic identity. So these are the type of images that you like to make. This is your authentic self, the type of images that you are skilled at making, and the type of images that the marketplace needs. Now, this wouldn't be a pitch deck without a Venn diagram. So here, here it is. Um, and, and that place is in the center. Images you like to make, that you're skilled at making, and that the marketplace needs. And this is always changing through trends and especially now. Okay, so emphasize the work that you want to do. Show where you want to go with your work, not necessarily where you've been. Own your own authentic story, your camera work style, your digital post-production style, your narrative, and show that you're, you're proud of it and that you're not trying to do too many different things to make people happy or trying to cover too many bases with your content. So to be a photographic brand, your values can't change to make a buyer happy. If you change your styles and specialties too easily or incongruently, the buyer becomes confused and uncertain of who you are and what they're gonna get. That's really important. And that's why people are always saying to focus on a congruent visual message. 
because you don't want to have your audience confused and uncertain. Otherwise, they're going to leave right away and not spend much time with your website or your brand story. And their buyer risk grows. Consistency, co consistent values and style create a mailing and, comp and compelling brand. Okay, galleries. These are your revenue streams. Think of galleries as revenue streams. Businesses need to clearly communicate what they do. Incongruent revenue streams can create brand confusion. Identify a message that unifies your revenue streams and make sure it's obvious and fills a need. Use gallery names that are intuitive. Now this varies a little bit if you're working in a, in a market where you can be more general than specialist, um, but it's important to think that your galleries are congruent. Showcase your work by client. There are many different ways of sequencing um, by a project, by category, a case study. Some of this depends on how your buyers like to buy work. But ultimately, you want to show you have a consistent vision. I've seen a few websites recently where photographers haven't used galleries. They've only used case studies to talk about their work. And I think that's kind of an interesting way of showing uh, a compelling visual story of how you solve someone's business problem with your work. So make it easy to see your work, an overview. No clicking, please, just sliding. Um, 30 to 40 images, three to six galleries, probably plenty. Um, many of you probably know some of this, sorry. Um, only show what is relevant to your audience, what you need to demonstrate that you are capable. So don't show too many images. You only need to show what you are capable of doing. Consistency instills confidence and redundancy bores. It also shows if you're, you're insecure if you show too much work. You don't need to show too much work to get the message across. Uh, so I licensed this from, I used to work for Adobe Stock and these are when I first saw these images and we talked a lot about the different types of imagery. Obviously, when you look at an image, you wanna see what is the better image? What image tells the story? Now. Better always depends on the context that you're putting it in, of course, but here to me, it's night and day. Now, it's always a good idea to get a second opinion or to work with a professional consultant or editor to help you edit your work. Because sometimes it's really hard before we get it mixed up with the sequence. Okay, visual trends. So identify and anticipate the content the customers need using research. This is really important, especially now, because a lot of trends that are happening are kind of a little mixed up and up in the air. So it's important to have this uh, at least in mind when you're thinking about the kind of work or the kind of markets you're going to be working with. So quantitative data is what's happened, measurable facts. Now, a lot of the measurable facts are a little bit out the window right now. Um, and we're looking more at qualitative patterns, what's happening right now. Um, what kind of, so for example, portraits of people across the street in their window. <laughs> um, we wouldn't have done that recently, but so that's a, a trend that's happening right now. So these are the different ways that you can use to research trends. Okay, and this is sort of towards the end of the, here, the conclusion. When photographers get started, they sometimes play it safe and they learn the rules and then they learn to bend them and to find their own voice. This is a natural progression and we all learn from example. We often see how others succeed and we model this. So then you grow and you learn and you start to create work that matters to you. And you discover your unique selling point and you learn how to use it. And when you embrace this mindset, the competition is about what's best for your clients and not about being uh, better or cheaper than someone else. That is what you're really selling. So keep that in mind. Thank you. How are we on time? OK. <laughs> so we're good, Cameron. And I know you had wanted to talk about showing some examples of websites and kind of walking through people, yeah. uh, how you think about guiding uh, a client of yours to make adjustments that you think would be relevant and help them succeed more directly. Do you want to do that now or do you want to take some questions? Yeah, let's, let's do that now. Okay, okay go so ahead. I'm going to share two websites because it's quarter up, so we've got good timing here. Uh, okay, 
Hold on one second. Okay, do you see this website for Allegra? Do you see it, Tom? Yes. Great. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Just want to make sure it's working. Okay. Yep. So here you is are. a Connecticut photographer, um, the ASMP Connecticut President's website. And I just want to point this one out because it does a really great job of using content. Um, now here, the, the pitch is a visual pitch right off the bat. And then you come down here and you have more text about who she is and what she's about. And I'm not going to go through every single page here but I just want to show you how some of these pages work. And I want to couch that and say, don't go out and copy her because what's working for her might not work for you. Um, you always keep that in mind. But this is how, how it can work for a business um, where you have the story here. Um, clients and awards. Again, this is coming in later in the content experience of someone, um, their FAQ page. How long you've been in business? Do you do motion? Do you do casting? Do you photograph tethered? You know, these are all great types of uh, things to be talking about, and it shows that you're an expert and you know, you know the drill. You know, you know how to run a set. Uh, you're conveying. Uh, you're reducing your audience's risk when they see this. Now, I think we're probably going to start seeing a lot more things about safety and. How do we work in COVID times now? Um, I think this um, probably, you know, I know this was done before that. Um, so we're going to start to see more of that on this kind of a page. Um, and then we have the philosophy page, which is really about her why. Why does she make photographs? Um, and then, of course, we have the galleries. Um, now, when we go into the galleries, one thing that I, that I really like about this is you have some positioning text at the beginning of each gallery. So it, rather than just starting off with photographs, it helps you really understand the context of why these photographs were made and what was the business purpose. And I think that's really important. I think a lot of photographers just start off with pictures. Uh, they have the gallery title and it's kind of, you know, there's a lot of uh, vagueness in terms of what are the photographs about and why were they made. Um, now here, she has a number of different types of galleries. Um, brand stories. So this is a certain kind of brand photography that she does. Personal branding. So you can imagine a photographer like Allegra who's working with commercial and personal branding has a lot of content to kind of sort out and to think about how to get it across to, the, to their audience in a clean, clear way that says that she knows what she's talking about. Where she has her commercial editorial work and then she has her personal branding photograph. And one would think that they're different markets and they're incongruent perhaps, and they can be, but if you give the, the audience a content journey in the right way, it, it all makes sense as being part of her brand and how she's using her experiences and skills to do what she, she does. Then the blog, okay? So this is you know, a great way to put uh, case studies and examples of your work where you talk about what the project was. Um, you can, of course, post this on LinkedIn and social and Facebook and further promote this work around. Of course, always tying in the people you collaborated with and getting everyone on board uh, through with sharing this type of content is, is really successful, I think. Um, and then, of course, you have a very clean contact page that gives people different ways, a nice picture of who, who the person is. It's very um, accessible, and then different ways of getting in touch, of course, different calls to action, further down, spending more time with her on Instagram or Facebook um, or her newsletter, um, what have you. Now, and then also, you know, she's also tied in her wedding photography business right here for people, um, because now that's a, a kind of a very, a bit uh, of a different market than the other two. So she's created a whole new branded site, but it still ties into her her um, her brand and her you know, content strategy. Um, so that's one site. Now I'm going to unshare this one and go into another one. Um, yeah.
Okay, do you see Janelle? Yes. Okay, so she is a photographer in California. And similarly, she has, you know, photographers now, they have their editorial and commercial, and then they have their, um, their brand. A lot of photographers are doing brand photography for small businesses. And Janelle's pitch, part of it, her unique selling point, is her changing the world one photograph at a time. She's really talking about her values for the earth, sustainability, um, and, and the fashion she photographs and how she talks about it. Um, and that will resonate with some people and, and it won't with others, of course. And again, there's a little bit of pitch text in the beginning that gives con some context to what the work is about through these different ga galleries. Um, of course, editorials add social proof. Uh, this is an environmental piece with trash, pollution. Um, and then here, her biography. So she has her um, philosophy and why she makes the work she does. Currently, the fashion industry is responsible for so much adversity from encouraging a narrow standard of beauty to human rights abuses and so forth. So she's really articulated her feelings about photography and why she does what she does with her philosophy. And then that'll be a little bit different than her, her brand story, her biography, which is um, more about her, where she came from. Um, and then of course, for her, she has a page for getting quotes, um, services and packages we talked a little bit about. So when a client sees how the packages are written about, advertising campaigns, lookbooks, social media campaigns, model influencers. This is going to help a, a, client, a certain type of client resonate with that type of project and say, she's speaking to my needs. I need to ask her about working with me. Uh, and then one other person who I don't know personally, but I think she's doing a really great job. And this, so this is more about the agency perspective. So if you're working those other were examples of individual photographers who are not reps. Um, this is an, uh, for a rep agency. And here, I think when you look at these photographers and you, each one of them has, so reps can do this too. This, this, uh, this isn't just for photographers who are not rep. This is also a content strategy for um, collectives or reps. So here you have people's uh, brand stories written about Um, okay, of course, Tim Tatter. So a client will read this and understand his interests and his history with athletics and why that makes him a perfect fit for photographing and aligning with some of these brands. Okay, so we can stop the share there and go to the Q and A. All right. Cameron, this is an amazing uh, presentation, and um, you, you know you're already getting rave reviews in the chat box. But I, I want before I go to the questions that we received overnight from people who were attending, I wanted to let you know that there's a lot of demand for this presentation. So are you willing to share it with us and allow us to post it afterwards? Because I know people would love to study it in depth. I think there's a lot of great stuff that's coming through right now. Yeah, yeah, sure. I, I mean, you can it's recorded and it can be available for people to. Excellent. People can people can can ask me questions too through email if they want follow up. But yeah, of course. So let me start with some of the questions that we received last night, and this first one is from Jody Jones, who I presume is working in the metropolitan tri-state area. What are ways one can get clients in a hot spot like New York while it's under quarantine? What would you suggest? Okay, well, this speaks to researching the client and to looking about how they at least used to buy photography. Um, did they buy it through an agency or through or directly to the photographers and to really know your client. So that hasn't changed too much in the sense that you, you always need to know how your client buys photography wherever they are in history. And to, to, to know that now, I think for more real time information, you wanna look at their social and see if they're talking about this on their Instagram or their Facebook or their LinkedIn um, to gain some clues there and, and what's changing from week to week as, as this moves forward. Um, if, they're, if they're commenting on how they're getting work done. Um, 
So again, I think talking about on your own website, in your FAQs, how you work remotely, how you work on a safe set, or how you plan to. Or, so you have the answers to their questions on your website that you think that they need to know. Um, I think I've seen uh, the idea of working remotely tethered, where clients can kind of have a window into your studio and look on the screen in real time. Um, that's a technology that's been around for a while, but of course it's getting more traction and more interest now. Uh, I think people are becoming a lot more comfortable not being person to person anymore. Um, this industry, like many, was so much about being together in the same space and networking and, and having after work conversations and, and whatnot. And now that's all happening on social media and through your content strategy. And um, again, being authentic to who you are, talking about how you can solve the needs of the problem, your clients' problems, and putting that out there through your content is really, really important. Um, so I think whether it's New York or anywhere, you, you need to sort of think of their problems, uh, how they used to get work done, how can they not work, what kind of work, now their work is also going to be changing too, because they, they themselves are trying to figure out well, what kind of content do we need to make. Um, I think if you can pitch ideas to solutions, I think that would be an interesting thing. I know, I know this is a great time to be doing personal projects for photographers at home and to be thinking about how are they talking about products and services. Um, and so to creating portfolio work that speaks to your, your client's problems now. Um, and, and, is, and, and, is, uh, and is current with trends. So for example, something I think about a lot now is when you see pictures of people who are in ads that are grouped together, you're like, well, that was pre-COVID. Um, it's the same way like when you, saw, when you see a cell phone in a picture that was a flip phone, like it looks dated. So a lot of clients need to update their content now with more undated context of social interaction um, because we're so sophisticated with our visual fluency now, everyone is, that when we see a picture of people having lunch together out of a cafe, we know that that's not a current real situation. So think about how are your clients' needs for imagery changing that, that speak to the current uh, lifestyle trends that have just switched over in, a, in a, like a month. Um, it's, it's, so everyone's still kind of grasping with that. It's not like it happened over 30 years. Um, yeah. I, That's great. So yeah. this one is from Dallas Fuentes. Storytelling and maintaining, storytelling through the images, and but also maintaining image continuity through all the media channels. What is your advice about that? Um, yeah, I think storytelling and having a sense of narrative with your pictures, whether it's a sense of narrative in the single image or through the series is, is really important because stories just really help people understand an idea or concept. Um, so through an image community, you know, you, you just need to think about where you're sharing this and go back and, re and review some of the, the points I've talked about here. But um, think about the platforms you're talking about giving your content and is your message relevant to what your audience wants to read about in those places and is it also consistent with your brand at the same time and this one from julia morris how do you start in branding photography at this time yeah um i think this is a big challenge because it's we're gonna have to wait i think a little, at least a few weeks or to the summer till people start feeling comfortable doing photo shoots together. But I think if you can talk about how your process is safe uh, in your FAQ, or maybe this belongs even more higher level, like on your homepage down below the fold a little bit, or maybe it's even part of your pitch, how you now do safe photography, safe portrait photography. I think we probably will see that soon, people pitching safe photography. And what does that mean? Well, maybe that means you have uh, no assistance um, or you have, uh, you know, all the masks and gear you need. Uh, you use long lenses, so you're not near anyone on set. There's a lot of ventilation, or you're only doing this in outdoor locations, and there's no, you don't, you don't need to be close. So if you're using a telephoto lens, you know, you can be, you know, several feet away and get a great picture still. And helping clients who maybe who don't buy 
branding photography a lot, understand what that means and having empathy for them to know that they don't know what a telephoto lens is or a long lens is and, and how it's possible to get great imagery from 10 or 20 feet away um, to helping educate your, your clients. So, but I do think that people are still probably a few weeks away from at least wanting to do that kind of photography. Yeah, I think that makes great sense. And this one from Karen Hirsch, what platform do you recommend for e-commerce for selling of fine art prints? Do you have a favorite? Uh, um, honestly, I, I like the idea of a photographer having their own branded website and promoting it on social media. I, I mean, you can go e-commerce, but I, I just think that if you can create an experience around your, your work that the buyer feels really connected to you, that they're buying, you know, in fine art, especially people buy artwork that the artist is so much part of the story of the work. Um, I've been fortunate to work with Hero and Avedon, and I know that their work, the people who buy that work are buying part of their story. They're not just buying the image. So I think if you can kind of create a really compelling story on your website that's branded around the work, I think that's really what how I would focus my attention rather than trying to, you know, selling it as a commodity on a on a website that sells a lot of other people. Okay. And this one is from Mary Kate Denny. And I, I think it's really interesting as a question in light of obviously the time that times that we're in. She says, I am interested in finding other ways to bring in clients during this time. And you know, I would love to hear your thoughts on that, Cameron. Yeah, I mean, I think this gets into how you market yourself on social media. How are you talking about your work in this current moment? How are you talking about how you do work? Do you do work at home? Um, if it, is it still life um, or portraiture? Uh, I mean, if you're in a still life kind of photographer, then, then it's probably a little bit easier to talk about how you're making new work now and how you can accept deliveries and you can ship stuff back and forth. And you need to you know, promote that. Um, always when you're marketing to someone, you want to market to a specific person if you can, so that the message is getting to specifically to them and they feel it's been genuinely placed in the right, in the right context. Um, so I think that, yeah, I think bringing clients so much about reaching out to your client and telling them your story and how you work now. Okay, and this one from Jennifer, who I guess has struggled with doing blogging in the past, and she wants to know, can I get started now, and what's the best topic to start with? <laughs> yes, I think, of course, now. I think now more than ever, uh, people are reading stuff, and they're wanting to read and find out about what people are saying and thinking about. Um, so, again, I would re-watch this, web this webinar for some of these ideas that I've spoken about. Um, but I think if you can think about who your audience is and what they want to read about and know about and where that overlaps with what you're good at and interested in, those are the kind of things that, that, that will matter. Of course, it's also too, so much about being true to your brand, being aware that what you're offering is a unique selling point and like what's the value of what you're offering, but also knowing what's the same about your, your brand too. Um, and having that, that voice and getting your voice out. Um, I think looking at what other bloggers and people are doing is really helpful, especially in the beginning, but to know that what's working for them may not work for you. Okay, and this one from Jeffrey Totero. As to social media and social and email marketing in these times, how should we be sensitive and not too pushy? And that's a, I think that's a concern that I've heard quite a number of our members ask in recent yeah. days. Yeah. I think, you know, I might've mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I think that, I think if you generally have something that will help someone, if you have a service or a kind of photography or a kind of way of making photography that you know people need and will help their business, I, I, I wouldn't, I, you shouldn't feel like you're being pushy if you think it's helpful. I think if you think it's, um, if there's something ingenuine or you're trying to make money and that's sort of the ultimate reason, then I think it will come off as maybe being pushy. But I think if your message is coming from a really honest, authentic place at what you're about and your story and how you solve problems is gonna help this particular business 
um, talk about their new catering business or their, their new curbside checkout or how are they working uh, to, to get their baked goods like to their, to their community through a photo story. And you can talk about how you can, how you can help the business with that so that they stay in business. I think that I wouldn't think that that's feeling too pushy you know, at, at all. I would so it's how, how you give your mindset for your work. I think that's a great answer. Um, Greg Nikas asks, I'm a photographer and uh, art gallery owner. What are your thoughts about selling online right now? Yeah, I think, I think that's, you know, I, uh, very relevant, of course. Um, I, I do know photographers who work in the art space. And I think more and more um, people in the art space are becoming comfortable buying work online, or at least being introduced to it. You're seeing more artists opening their studios up through Zoom and Facebook and Instagram video. And um, so people are becoming more, artists are becoming more social and letting people into their worlds and into their stories more than they had before. Um, so I think you, that also means that the art market is becoming more comfortable with online purchasing and experiences too. Um, just the way people are becoming more comfortable with Zoom and even learning about Zoom. Um, so, yeah, I think people are becoming, I think the people are becoming more, they're becoming more mid to, mid adopters now in terms of buying art online. And, and perhaps if there's some sort of guarantee that if you're not happy with it, you can return it <laughs> if you get it in the mail and, and you don't like it. Because we all know that what, what we see on the internet isn't what actually translates to what's there in our physical life. So that's, in, you know, one of the things we lose. Um, so perhaps if there's a certain, sort of like a return policy that, Makes sense. <laughs> That's great. Thanks. Yeah. And then this one is from Victorio Milian. Are newsletters worth the investment right now, both in time and expense, do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think so. Newsletters, um, newsletters serve a lot of different purposes. I think if they're done well and the content is really relevant and thoughtful to the people that are getting it, then you should do them. Uh, there are a few newsletters I get from photographers and companies, and I really want to know what they're talking about and what's going on. And they've written it to me, or I, I'm their ideal audience, so it makes sense to do that. So I think um, I think it kind of becomes a problem when you have too many subscribers that aren't really relevant to your to your market, and you're paying for uh, paying for that through your newsletter service. Um, I think that is one of the downsides to having too many newsletters. But there, so there's also the, oh, the so no, there's so many other things to talk about newsletters, the open thing. So even if a newsletter goes into your inbox and someone sees it, it's still marketing. They're still seeing your name pop up. You're still getting that person's um, what have you show up and you're, you're being reminded. Now, I think in terms of scheduling for newsletters, I, I like to see newsletters every once a month or every quarter from, photographers, because maybe not that much has changed. I think if you're getting them every week, I think, I think the frequency of them can be important to think about um, with your audience. How often do they need to see your content? How much is changing from, from time to time? Um, but I, I do think that it, I, I, you can't ignore them and they're, they are really relevant. And if you have an offer or a new service to talk about, I think that they're really helpful for your audience. It could be. Do, do, this is sort of my own kind of follow on to that is, do you think that there's a a um, frequency rhythm that has to be maintained in order to make it successful or can that vary? Yeah, I mean, I think this gets to conveying a sense of showing up and being professional and being dependable and being reliable. And if you, through these little small acts of posting and newsletters, if you post or send a newsletter once uh, a month or once a quarter and you and you do it, you know, in a in a consistent way. You're you're helping your audience know that you are dependable, reliable. There's a sense of professionalism about that that will help re reduce buyer's risk. Um, so I do think having having a somewhat of a predictable schedule is helpful. Now it has to make sense with the content that you're putting out because um, you don't want to just bombard people for no reason. Um, but I do think yeah, having a schedule is, is, is helpful. Now, for some for some audience people, you know, depend, for some audiences, you want to get your content once a week. Some people want it once a day. Um, again, it really depends on the audience. 
Okay, that's great. From Cheryl Dorskind, what are your thoughts about a homepage? Should your homepage be your about, you know, in terms of who you are, or should it be something else? What do you suggest? Yeah, well, I mean, I think you need to have a really powerful visual, right? um, a pitch phrase or a statement that says what you're about. Um, and then that, so you have your above the scroll homepage, and I've talked about this a little bit, so you can rewind, people can rewind, but you have your above the scroll line and below the scroll line, which is sort of like you're above the fold in the newspaper and the below the fold. So right when someone visits your website, you want them to see a really powerful image and perhaps some text, your name, um, really clear wayfinding around how to navigate. Um, homepages are really important. Now, I wouldn't put your brand story, your full brand story on your homepage. I would put that on a separate page and craft it and design it around your brand story. Um, on your pitch page, your home page, that's where you have you know one picture, your message, and then you can kind of scroll down and give them more information and kind of unfold your story, your content as they go further into your journey. Okay. And this one from David Seide, which makes me laugh when as I even as I'm reading it. Early adopters are great to work with creatively, but rarely have the budgets to match. How do you approach this common discrepancy? Yeah, I mean, I think this kind of depends where you are in your business and what you want out of the job or the project. Um, there's probably more creativity and authority, auth authorship over the project for the earlier ad adopter projects. Um, and they can be great for portfolio work, especially if you hadn't done a lot of work. It can be great to show how you work with people to, to start to get some case studies, some material for case studies. Um, because again, remember the project is the project, but you can get so much content value out of a project from talking about it and how you, how you did it and post about it. So there's so much value, marketing value to projects beyond just, just the project it, itself and the deliverable that you're giving to your client. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think early adopters, you know, probably have less budget. Um, but there's more authorship over their work. So it just depends on where you are with your portfolio and, and the times a bit too. Okay. And this one from Mary Hagman. Do you recommend listing specific prices on your services or, you know, services or packages page? Um, I think it depends on your market and who you're, who you're working with. Um, I think it can be very helpful to buyers to see prices. Um, and what you're selling packages. Now, I think it's perfectly fine to, to say, call me for prices or inquiry or to not have them on there. That's the safer choice. Um, but I think if you think about your own buying experience, you kind of want to, to have a sense of the cost of things. And again, it depends on the kind of work. If we're talking about retail or commercial work with licensing. But um, I do think you want to think about you know, empathy for your audience. And now if you have a lot of different kinds of services and packages, then it might be too complicated to, to sort of have a price, have price points. Um, but also don't forget having price points can help pre-qualify buyers. So when people see your product or service, you're not going to spend a lot of time with a lead who is going to find out that you're too expensive for what they need or the product or service. Um, so I, I think it depends a bit on, on what you're offering in the market that you're offering to. But those are a couple of thoughts on pricing. That's great. And this one from Harry Lee. What advice do you have for someone who's just getting starting out with little or no social media exposure at this point? Where do they put their energies? Yeah, well, if you're a photography business, I think having an Instagram account and I think having a mix of, of content that you're putting out that partly informational about who you are and your brand um, and talking a bit about, um, you know, I, I, again, I think of Instagram in social media, you need to know what the platform is about and what the audience is looking for on each page. So with LinkedIn, people are looking more for thought pieces and professional kinds of things. On Instagram, it can be a little more entertainment and uh, lighter. Um, but again, it be, does become this, this mood board history of what you're about. And if you're just starting out, 
you're kind of thinking about well, what what, am, what is this tapestry of me that I'm creating? Um, so I think it's it's important to not get too caught up in the likes and the numbers and all that stuff. It's more important to think about how are you um, addressing your audience that you want to reach, um, and the, and the diversity of your content, whether that's your own personal life story, your professional life. And then your calls to action. If you if you have a new idea for a service to work with someone, um, but it's never a bad time to get started in social media. I mean, kids are doing it every day. <laughs> but again, the, the more the, the more thoughtful strategy you have from the beginning at the outset, uh, the better. I think if you know where you're going yeah. with it. Totally makes sense. Yeah. And this one from Jonathan Hillier. I'm an architectural photographer. Most of my work includes lots of people in the photograph and working closely with my client and the system is critical to the outcome of the shoot. I don't really know how to do this safely or if it's even possible for a long, long time in the future, to, you know, obviously because of the COVID-19 situation and I'm very safety conscious. What, what, you know, recommendations or what thoughts do you have about the dilemma that Jonathan's articulating here? Yeah, well, he's not alone. Um, I, I was just talking to a Connecticut architecture photographer about this, and they were talking. I mean, so, again, this gets into talking on your website about the, the, the new reality. Um, this is going to be a couple of weeks to a month month away, but having safe safety on set, um, drone photography for architecture comes to mind because you can be far away. You don't need, to, you know, you can you can you can make pictures without having people involved. Perhaps, um, I think the interior kind of types of photography is where you get. You don't need people inside, but you do need access into a building. So the more clients feel comfortable opening up their buildings again to to, to work, um, it's going to be a process, I think, before we get there. Um, but I do think if you can talk about how you work safely. Uh, how you work with drone photography and why your new safe process is the new the new normal and the new USB for you in your in your type of architecture photography, you'll start getting work quicker when it's needed because I mean people are going to be needing to sell property, rent property. Um, it, it it's not going the demand for it is not going to go away. So, th but you need to think about how are you addressing it with your FAQs and your services. Okay, and this one from Tracy Brown, which really speaks to the kinds of alignments that you and I talked about off camera, Cameron. What social media channels work best for what types of photo businesses? Well, certainly Instagram, I think, works well across the board for, for everyone. And I almost think of Instagram as like the companion website for photographers now. Um, I mean, some photographers also, that is their website. I think Instagram is, you kind of need to be there now almost. Um, I think Facebook can be really relevant too, especially if you're working more perhaps with retail, um, doing wedding and portraits and uh, people who don't buy photography a lot, it's more community-based perhaps. Um, LinkedIn, I don't think is, is as essential perhaps for a lot of photography businesses. I think Instagram and your website are really the two where I would focus most of my energy for photography. Okay, that's great. And this one from Heinrich Bior. When you say newsletter, I imagine you're meaning a blog post or an article online, not print, is that correct? Correct. I, we're not talking about mailing paper to people. It's, a, it's a, an email newsletter that someone can opt into. So on websites, a lot of photographers, a lot of businesses have an opt-in where you can enter your email address and sign up to get um, news emails that, that are informational um, letters about your goings on and sometimes they're promotional and all have a certain call to action in them. Um, that's what I guess I mean by that. Yeah. Okay. And this one from Robert. Do you have any recommendations when building a new website? What should I look for or avoid given the content that you have recommended? What should I look for or avoid? Well, I think if you look at, if you, if you, if you can rewatch this uh, webinar and look at all the different pages that I spoke about, 
and to think about the, the different types of content that you need to be telling your audience about you. Uh, and then you can kind of create a map. I, I, would, I know I haven't talked about this too much, but I would emphasize that it's really helpful to work with a, a consultant uh, of some sort on this, um, sometimes more than one type, uh, web designer or content strategy consultant like myself, or a photo editor you know, type of consultant, and to have someone who can give you perspective on your voice and your language and your words is really important. Small businesses, photography businesses, it's they're often just solopreneurs. And um, they so often try to yeah, do it all. And to have and someone it's really almost an impossible perspective to try to think that you can do your it all voice in your or do it all well. In your words. So I think if it's really you important. can spend Small businesses, some money or time, photography businesses are often just to solo help to, just to help and someone help you see so your own try to do it all self and through and another it's really almost an impossible lens. Feat the the common um, quote is you can't do it all see well. The label so from the inside you can spend some so money or think about that like you need someone to help you craft you and professionally craft your your words and your vision um, most other businesses work with professional consultants um, outside of themselves like uh, to get special um, services like accounting services and uh, marketing services and uh, coaches of some sort and so um, it's really important to think about getting an outsider's view on your strategy for how to build this. But I think if you look at what I've talked about, that'll at least get you started on, on a plan. Okay. And this one is coming from one of our Facebook uh, listeners who's coming in, uh, Roger Barone. When it is it beneficial to give photos away? For example, famous people or PR specialists who would be worth forming a relationship with? What's your view on that as a strategy for building um, relationship? Well, I guess if you be means giving them away as prints or as a license that's a great question it doesn't specify so i think you could take it in both directions and just yeah give so i guess I would, I would say for the easy one is if it's a print i say for sure you know send people prints of the work there's very little harm done um and that uh, sign it with a nice note and, and that's great um i think that if you're talking about licensing it gets a little bit more tricky um i think that you you do want to let them use the image for for nothing to at least have a contract or something in writing that explains the discount that you're giving them so you know you're giving someone a thing of value wh whatever that is a thousand dollar license or what have you so you're setting a precedent for your value even if you're giving it or want to give it away um, or finding a way of incorporating that into your delivery of of the image asset um, I, I probably wouldn't recommend it that much, but I would, you know, also on social media, so much is just tossed around and linked and shared for, for nothing anyway. But it just depends a little bit on how this person is going to use the image. If they're going to use it for their own personal social media, that may not be you know, worth very much as a use, but if they're going to use it in an advertising purpose, that's kind of a different story. Yeah, and I think we have obviously are experiencing a lot of that right now with some of the conversations around Instagram and its terms of service and the stances that we've taken as an organization. And I would certainly like to emphasize what you just said, Cameron, about the idea of, you know, if you're going to deliver an image that you're going to give somebody the decision, to, you've made the decision to allow them to use it for free, indicating what the real value of it is mm -hmm. as a way of establishing your own uh creative bona fides and identifying. So anyway, one last question coming at you, and this one from Glenn Clark. Coming out of this, given the situation that we're in now with COVID-19, photographers may well choose to reduce the fees that they're charging for jobs simply as a way of building back work. Should I stick to pre-virus fees or reduce fees for work too? What will be the long-term ramifications of lowering one's fees and how does one raise them back later? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, and this kind of gets to how I concluded my, my deck before. Um, I advise against lowering your fees. Um, I think it, it'll, it'll, if you look at what happened in 2008 with the last crash and how everything, kind of the bottom fell out of everything, it took a long time for, for prices to come back up. Um, so once you set a precedent for a discount or or 
uh, lower level prices, uh, it's really hard to get back to where you once were. So acknowledging that as a fact is, is important. Um, I think that, it's, again, pitch yourself as the best solution for the client's problem, not the cheapest solution. And you really want to be competing with other photographers because you're the best fit for what they need done, not because you're the cheapest. Now, I know in a time like this COVID moment where there's a lot less work, people are going to be taking any job they can get, whether or not they're the best person for it or not, and, or, or if they, there's a better photographer for it. Now, that's just going to happen, unfortunately. Um, but I, I would, again, I would strongly suggest not reducing fees, but if you do, always let someone know the true value of the work and writing so that they understand the discount and what, what, what it is they're getting. To never just lower the price and say, this is the new price, but to explain why this is a discount and for what purpose it is um, would be a really important strategy for, to pri for, for lowering a price. Okay, this has been great. Cameron, I want to thank you so much for your time today and for all the excellent wisdom and advice that you've dispensed. I think it's been a fantastic conversation. To everybody who's tuned in and is still listening, I want to thank you for doing so. I also want to remind you that we will be doing our town hall meeting at 3 o'clock Eastern on Friday, and there's a lot of questions, as you might expect, about the latest round of stimulus that's out there being offered, and I know I'm already hearing lots of concerns from different photographers, so please stay tuned and plan to join us for that. Next week at this time, we'll be featuring Sibylla Smith, a photo educator and creative coach who will be talking about how you look inside and change possibly aspects of your own creativity using the time that we're in as a vehicle for that. And finally, I'm going to make a shameless ask right now, which I hope is not shameless. I think all of you understand what we are trying to do as ASMP to bring value to you at a time when we're all facing a tremendous amount of uncertainty and angst. And I'm going to ask you if you valued what you've heard today, if you'd be willing, if you have the ability to do so, to make a $5 donation to us to help us continue to do the kind of work that we're doing both in the advocacy space and in the legal support space. That small donation would really be, go a long way toward ensuring that we're able to continue what we're doing. So if you have the wherewithal, I would really appreciate you taking that into consideration. And I want to thank you again for being on today. And I look forward to seeing you on Friday and again next Wednesday. And Cameron, thank you again for a wonderful presentation today. My pleasure. Thank you for having me on, Tom. All right. Take care and have a good day. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Stay safe. <laughs>